We had a murder video to start AEW Dynamite this week. A murder video. Also, hello my friends and welcome to Ups and Downs, the review show where I, Simon Miller, take my finger of power and when I like something, I give it up and when I don't like something, I give it a down. Now listen, I'm just gonna let you know right now, this episode of Ups and Downs is gonna upset some people, okay? But I'm always truthful. I talk from my tum-tum and remember, my opinion doesn't mean squat. So you ready? Good? Get your tush going, and we're gonna go. That was not the best start. So anyway, this video, it was John Moxley talking about the fact he had tried to kill Brian Danielson at All Out, when he was like, man, I didn't really want to do it. It wasn't my choice. I didn't like it. I was like, yeah, too late now, John. The cops are already onto you. The point is, though, when the Black Bull Combat Club was formed, there was not meant to be any niceness, and there wasn't meant to be any respect. They were gonna get stuff done. But Brian, he doesn't really have the edge for that because he is too much of a pleasant guy. When I say edge, I don't mean Adam Copeland. He even referenced William Regal saying that Brian Danielson was his favorite, but he always had more in common with John Moxley. When he talked about the AEW locker room, he's like, man, look, it's out of control now. These egos are running around the place. And that's why we've got to stop them. So once again, Danielson, we don't think you've got the Moxley or the Moxie. Didn't work. Well, no, he actually said that up to this point they had been trying the Brian Danielson way. And where did it get them? Absolutely nothing. So this is me talking now. I suppose John decided, well, we can't just tell him this. We can't talk to him. We must get a plastic bag and choke him to death. I mean, it's very sensible all round. We also saw footage of Danielson being wheeled out of All Out on a stretcher. And yeah, I was like, are we sure this man isn't deceased? I mean, he was barely moving. I do have to say that this totally ruled and it was well shot. And really, you're not supposed to know what John Moxie is going on about. That is the whole deal here. But man, it has me so intrigued. And there were more beats throughout this episode of Dynamite. But this version of John Moxley feels totally refreshed. So he has used his break and he has just come back. And he is like a giant question mark. So we can call him the Riddler. But I am going to give it an up because it makes my brain go. Well, I want to know what's going to happen. And that is the point of weekly TV. Bravo all round. It's also super funny as well, if you are a bit screwed up like me. Because essentially John Moxley decided, well, don't really like the way that Brian Danielson is doing stuff. So let's kill him. Where now came Christian Cage? Excellent. Now he said that his son Nick Wayne had told him that he had infinite aura. So I was gone right away. Let's face it, it is true. Because he has been carrying AEW on his back from the beginning. He also has lots of live show charisma, and I suppose we should call it cinema. He also has a world title shot, but he's just having the best time, because now he's proud of Kill Switch, because at the pay-per-view, Kill Switch had started to strangle Christian, and apparently this proved to his fake dad that he finally understands that he does need to be a killer. So AW needs a new tagline. Forget where the best wrestle, it should be where murderers can come and everybody is cool with it. I think this was just to establish that the patriarchy are a unit again, when Christian said, hey, I was gonna come out here and sign my contract because I can catch it in whenever I want. But we're in Kentucky and you ain't getting no title shot. Christian did promise that he would eventually win the world championship though, and that it would be Brian wishing that Brie, his wife, had CTE because then she would forget the beating that Christian is going to put on this man. So once again, I'm just like, <laughs> that came out of somebody's mouth. Everybody is totally unhinged. It was a really cool reminder, though, because right now everybody is out to get Brian Danielson. And that's what happens when you have the world title around your waist. We also saw Kip Sabian at ringside looking on here. And he keeps hanging around the patriarchy like a bad smell. So maybe he's going to join them. Wouldn't mind that. Kip Sabian does deserve more opportunities. Listen, I just think Christian is the best. It's getting it up. When Don Callis found Will Ospreay in the back, because our main event was going to be a casino gauntlet tag team match, and Will Ospreay at the moment has won every single casino gauntlet he's been in. That's like, well, Don, that is true, but he's also only been in one. Whole point, though, is that Donny Boy wants Will to team with Carl Fletcher. And even though Osprey was like, I need to focus on the international title, don't forget a few months ago, Will Osprey had promised Don Callis a favor, so he's calling it in. And Carl did too. He was like, we've teamed around the world. Why don't we do it again? So they came together with love. Now, I don't think Takeshita was very happy about this because he went and looked at the ground. When you look at the ground, it means you're a sad panda. When Jack Perry arrived in that crappy truck he drives, I mean, somebody should find him. He was super late. It was time for his match. He was also facing Leo Rush. 
because of course people online were mad. Ugh, how can we justify this? I mean, maybe AEW should have shouted about it a bit more. But the TNT title ever since it was birthed onto this planet has always been about open challenges. So if you want to do a random match, well, most of the time you can get away with it. It was also really good though, because I think people forget that Leo Rush is super talented. And Jack knew this too. As soon as the bell rang, he jumped it. Now, Stanford also told us during this that Brian Danielson is at home recovering. I was like, I'm sorry, we're like 20 minutes into the show. Why wasn't that my update? When I did tune in, you had me thinking somebody was actually dead. That's not right. Now, thank goodness he wasn't on this show because that wouldn't have made any sense. And Axel Andretti was out with Leo Rush because they're kind of friends now when Leo started to do a bunch of springboards. But then Perry smacked him in the face when he baited action. And the referee was like, oh, I saw what you did. And he sent him to the back. Now, admittedly, at first it was like, that is the lamest ejection I've ever seen in wrestling. But the commentators told us the referee had been called to the Young Bucks office before this. So once again, they are pulling their strings. I'll go back to what I said a minute ago. Maybe we should have been a bit louder about this but it just means you have to listen. It actually worked against Perry, because as soon as Action Andre was gone, Leo Rush hit his speed button, and he basically turned into Sonic. I mean, he hit so many damn dives, I forgot what was happening, and he got a Spanish fly for a one 2 ooh. I mean, he was never gonna win, but still. Jack never turned fire with the snake eyes. I was chuckling again. So I imagine it was literal. So you go up to your opponent, and you show them some eyes from a snake. I mean, that would freak me out. I mean, it would freak anybody out unless your name's Jake Roberts. From nowhere, Leo Rush then hit a Poison Rana, which is at risk of becoming the most overused move in 2024, where he jumped at Jack Perry, which did not work. He got kneed out of midair. When Perry was like, oh yeah, my knee is a decent weapon, he hit another one, one, two, three. So he likely needed that because, of course, he did lose at the weekend and he is the TNT champion. And he got interviewed after this, and I think he said he was going to crucify people. If that is the case, bring it down. There's the crime counter. I looked it up. You are not allowed to threaten to crucify people. He then drove away on his bus. So all he does now is come to the arena, do a match, and then leave. But yeah, look, this was nice and simple. We had gone, Ugh, we need to make sure Jack Perry is victorious. So I'm going to give it an up. I'm a big fan of Leo Rush. He's got it in his boots. We then saw footage of the biggest crime of the century from All Out, which was Hangman Page versus Swerve Strickland in that damn cage. When Renny Paquette was interviewing the cowboy, I got a little bit uncomfortable. Why isn't he in jail? Now, Renny did ask the cowboy where his head was at, and without any kind of provocation, Hangman just went, if Swerve Strickland had 1,000 houses, I would have burnt them all down. So there it is, the crime counter. What Paige essentially did here was tell you, I'd love to be a serial arsonist. Basically, he is happy with everything he has done to Swerve. And if anybody disagrees, he will totally murk him, which happened because he walked off camera where Paquette did get interrupted and Adam Page just beating people up and he even saw the Dark Order. And they were like, man, you used to be our friend and we don't even recognize you anymore. I mean, he does have a new moustache. Jeff Jarrett also turned up to warn Adam, because he's like, man, I've seen this behavior before, and it ends in shame and guilt. When he reminded Adam, oh yeah, by the way, you basically attacked my wife at all in. So Hank and Adam Page just beat the shit out of him before Jeff Jarrett's crew came and eventually ran him off. So you've got to imagine that we will be doing Double J versus Hangman again, which I do not mind because they just have an odd chemistry that I do enjoy. But this version of Adam Page is so brilliant. Like, there's so much to it. There's nuance. And if you want to have massive nerd conversations about the persona, well, you absolutely can. It also comes from a place of justification because do not forget it all began when someone tried to basically abduct his family and he is the best thing in AEW right now. Let's not name the Outrunners, giving it an up. When we got a match cancelled, damn it. Because he was meant to be something with Commander and Private Party when out came the Blackpool Combat Club with Marina Shafir. And yeah, those guys got absolutely murked. I mean, they weren't even able to make it to the ring. Now, Wheeler Yuta was not with them because he stayed home with Brian, so put that in your head. When Pac picked up a microphone, he was like, listen, I have been lost for a long old while, but finally I have been found. So he was like reciting nursery rhymes. He also said that AEW was broken and what had happened at All Out was inevitable. So now he's become Thanos. He ended all of this by saying it's due to the failure of diplomacy. So I was chuckling again. I was like, wait a minute. You're saying you did all these things and the answer was attempted murder. Once again, 
if you get taken to trial, you're going to be found guilty. Now there is more coming to this later, so we will get to it. But again, in terms of teasing and making you be like, what the hell is going on here? AEW doing a very good job. I do have a down though, and yes, this is where it starts. I have been a bit of a Debbie Downer today, so you do have to forgive me. But I felt quite sorry for Private Party here. I mean, the main event was a big tag team match. They weren't in it, and instead they were absolutely massacred here. I mean, that just kind of gives the impression that we shouldn't care about Private Party. And I do care about Private Party. So in hindsight, I think we should have probably put other team in there giving it down. The learning tree then arrived in Chris Jericho's brand new Bentley and he was wearing that jacket that Orange Cassidy destroyed four or five years ago. I looked at it and I was like, well, doesn't actually look that bad. This is why he did indeed steal Orange Cassidy's backpack though and after their match later, he was going to reveal the contents. So I guess it was a bit like who done it. You'll have to stay tuned. When it was party flippy time 9000, also known as Ricochet versus Sammy Guevara, I mean, this is exactly what you would expect. Because it really was just flip, dive, duck, dodge, do a jump. Oh, he's gone over the top ropes. That's flipping Ricochet. Did a flip. He did like a sky twister press and he landed on his feet. I mean, that is so impressive. And they fought up the stage. And Sammy did a moonsault off the entrance way. I mean, why wouldn't you do that? He also kind of hurt his ankle here. And I was like, well, surprise, surprise. What did you think was going to happen when he was using Barry Barricade? When, of course, Ricochet just flipped out of a move and he started doing his own kind of flips. You can tell he's got a real bee in his bonnet at the moment. And I imagine as he does get more acclimatized to AEW, well, we may be about to be in for some special stuff. There was then some proper wrestling tennis because Guevara was able to hit a cut up, then he missed the shooting star press. So Ricochet went, hey, come here. And he booted him right in the face. Looked pretty stiff. Sammy Guevara at least sold it like he had been knocked out when Ricochet hit the vertigo for the one, two, three. Now listen, I have missed out at least 37 flippy dippy doo da moves here. But that's because you need to sit down and watch it for yourself. It's just a lot of fun. We also made sure that somebody pressed start on controller too, because right after this, the Beast Mortis ran down to the ring. He was going to totally annihilate Ricochet before Sammy Guevara, being a babyface, chased him away for a chair. Now, the reason you should be excited about this is because Ricochet is one of the best high flyer in the world. And in terms of Mortis, he is like one of the best bases in the world. So if that isn't one of the most entertaining matches of the year, you can call me Steve. This was nice and simple though, because clearly we are going to get Ricochet a bunch of wins so he can justify taking on Will Ospreay, which will probably happen before the end of 2024. And everybody can melt down up. When Akada won the night, he does this a lot. Because Rene Paquette was asking him, how did it go at All Out? And at first he was like, man, oh, it was so hard. When he flipped on a dime, he went, ha. <laughs> No, it wasn't. It was really easy. Don Callis and Takeshita then walked in because, of course, Takeshita was in that match, but Akada never pinned him. Akada was like, listen, you just calm down right now. You are going to be a champion one day, but in terms of this continental title, well, it's never going to be yours. So I will presume they are going to fight a Grand Slam. And Akada then left and walked back in the room so he could call Takeshita a bitch. <laughs> so bring it down. There it is. The bitch counter. It's already out of control. Darby Allen then finally made his big return to AEW and we knew this was coming. We had seen him skateboarding into the arena earlier in the night. Now he had heard that John Moxie had been looking for him. So he was like, well, I'm not hard to find, dude. You should come out here right now. So out came John Moxley and he was with Marina Shafir. Now John was about to go off about something when Darby shut him right down. He was like, listen, man, I've always respected you. I've always liked you because here we are in the big time and you still go to indie shows because you love this business so much. And even when we first fought outside of All Elite Wrestling, I looked at you and I could feel this. So basically, you were my hero. The thing is, though, what Mox did to one of his best friends, Brian Danielson, Darby Allen never could have done to anyone because he kind of sees a similar relationship between him and Sting. So in terms of how he feels about him right now, well, you suck. I'm obviously kid he's been planning this for a while because he's like, you need to just calm down boy because brian danielson is injured he is not going to be able to compete at grand slam so given that you have a title shot for that evening well you've got to give it to me that's what he said now alan was absolutely offended by this and was like have you lost your mind and even said maybe you started drinking again and the fans got that one they went ooh. alan then pushed all the right buttons because he said fine look if you want to earn it you can and moxley agreed to this so now at that show we are getting Darby Allen versus John Moxley with the number one contendership on the line. 
What is happening? Don still went off by saying, Darby Allen, you don't understand and you're always going to be lower on the totem pole than me, even though I do still quite like you. I was like, John, I want to be that guy. This is gaslighting. Either way, he's going to teach Darby a lesson when Alan was like, well, listen, dude, if you want to burn AEW to the ground, I will make sure I drag you into the flames. I was like, Darby, that's a good lie. Because Moxie is totally crazy now, he then bowed and he walked off. I couldn't help it. I felt it in my tootsie toes. It's like, what the flub is going on? It is so damn great, though, because John Moxley's performance, once again, is so intriguing. Like, he is walking this tightrope between the good and the bad, but he clearly quite believes in whatever his aim is, and I absolutely want to see how this is going to play out. Once again, that is the secret source. I mean, maybe he does beat Darby Allen, and maybe he's the guy to retire Brian Danielson. Kind of gets me a little bit scared. Up. Right after this too, we also saw Nigel McGuinness interrupt Christopher Daniels because he had to see Tony Khan right away. So take that and put it in your pocket. You will see. Before that though, it was a women's title eliminator match between Mariah May and Queen Aminata. I just thought this was a pretty solid thing. I was also happy for the Queen because she has totally earned this. They began by punching each other in the face when Mariah was like, nope. I'm gonna slap you instead. I was like, isn't that the wrong way round? Shouldn't you do slaps and then go to punches? I don't think it matters. Aminata then had another idea because she went for the hip attack, but she totally missed when Mariah May started to strangle her using the ropes and gave her a kiss. I was like, those two things don't really compute with each other. She also booed her right in the head when Aminata was like, well, fine, I'm gonna give you all the suplexes because she gave her a snap version and a German one when she too smacked Mariah May right in the head. She got a one 2 ooh. Now the only real shame here is that there was no jeopardy whatsoever because the Queen was never going to win this. And eventually Mariah May was able to get out of a move and she hit a draping DDT and then she was good to go. Because Queen even decided to go to the top rope, which you cannot do in 2024, so May hit that big old knee when she finished her off with Storm Zero. One, two, three. Mariah then got a microphone and was like, well, I'm so sad I haven't done my championship celebration yet, but there is a reason. Mina Shirakawa, I need you back to do it. So quite clearly, Mina's gonna come back soon. Now I do feel like we need a proper feud for this championship because Mariah and Tony did such good work. You wanna keep that momentum going. But so far, it's totally fine. Also, I'm never going to get mad at somebody getting an opportunity, especially someone like Queen Aminata, because if you do watch all of AEW's programming, she is always bringing the goods. Just a shame it kind of went past so fast. Still going to give it up. The Young Bucks were then cutting a promo and essentially said, yeah, you want to talk about it? The AEW tag team division sucks right now. Damn. But the point was is that they've been doing all the heavy lifting over the last five years. So don't get mad at us, Matthew and Nicholas, if your favourites can't raise the bar. And that's why we went and sorted this main event. Let's see if somebody can grab the brass ring. No, it was your standard Young Bucks thing, but it did set up what we were going to do later. When we also did have a tag team match. It was the Learning Tree versus the Iron Savages. And I'll be completely honest with you. I like the Iron Savages. So it's always good to see it. It really wasn't much of a match though, because essentially Chris Jericho ran away from these guys where Big Bill and Brian Keith did all the heavy lifting. And after Brian had hit the diamond dust, Jericho tagged in and he did his foot on the chest, come on baby. And he actually got the three. <laughs> Damn, I didn't see such a massacre come. Now Chris did live up to his promise because he revealed what was in Orange's backpack after this. And it was a picture of the best friends. I actually thought that was quite nice because it goes to show you, even though Orange did lose his buddies, they still mean something in his heart. I also did chuckle because I am a nerd. I was like, why would he have a real picture? It's 2024, put it on your phone. Jericho also had a lesson here though, because if you are in the wrestling business, you do not have any real friends. And the camera was kind of focused on Big Bill here because he looked at Christopher and you could see it in his eyes. I assume he thought they were pals. Oh yeah, ironically, he just learnt the lesson, T's incoming. Chris also still wants the money for his jacket when we cut to the big screen. And Orange Cassidy was there and he was like, hey man, I've got your money and here is $5,000, but it was in like coins. And Kyle O'Reilly and Mark Briscoe drove a cherry picker or a forklift, whatever you call it, to Chris Jericho's brand new car and they poured it into the driver's seat. Now one, very handy that Chris Jericho decided on this night to drive his brand new car to the arena. And two, this did not work as intended. It did no damage at all. It would take somebody five minutes to clean it up. 
But Chris Jericho goes on the floor going, why? Why? It's like, Chris is going to be totally fine. So look, I did like the bit with the picture because I like sentimentality in my wrestling. But otherwise, I don't understand why we've gone back to a five-year-old feud that was over a jacket. And in terms of this angle with the vehicle, it was a swing and a miss. And look, that's totally fine. Not every single thing you do on wrestling TV can be a success. I mean, there's too much of it. Ultimately, though, something just feels missing with this. I mean, maybe I just don't need to see Orin Cassie versus Chris Jericho again. But I'm being honest with you, I think it's got to get it down. When things got wonderful and confusing, like my hairline. Because Nigel McGuinness came to the ring, and yes, at Grand Slam, given that Darby Allen is now taking on John Moxley in terms of that evening, there is no world title match. He's right. Now it is great news for Danielson because he's so injured, he's probably stuck in some iron lung, choking away, much like Justin Roberts, when he gets strangled with a tie. That's, that, that's a good reference. Nigel is sick and tired of seeing all of Brian's success, though, especially because it has been going on for so many years. And when he searches his feelings like a Jedi, he knows the truth. Brian Danielson is scared of Nigel McGuinness. The good news is that Tony Khan doesn't feel the same when he revealed a piece of paper. And yeah, it's a contract for New York City that if everybody signs it means we will actually get Brian versus Nigel. I tell you, I was doing the dance of joy. If you have been following their careers, you have wanted this for basically 10 years. Now McGuinness did make it very clear that Brian has to accept this and it's not a guarantee, but I'm just gonna keep this simple. It's such a good announcement and it's a match I want so damn much, I am absolutely giving it an up. But yes, there's also a damn caveat because it sort of makes sense but it also makes no sense at all, bear with me. Because earlier in the night, it was kind of made clear that Darby Allen would never take advantage of Brian Danielson like John Moxley did. So I suppose even if AEW tried to make Brian Danielson have a world title match, Darby would say no, because he doesn't want to be like John, who he now thinks is a bit of a dick. Now again, Moxley could have also been lying about Brian Danielson's status, but we just didn't shout this enough, or once again make it clear to the audience, because the only reason Darby agreed to fight John is because he doesn't get to have a world championship match, which he already had guaranteed for Grand Slam. Still with me? No, don't worry about it. Because the major point is we got to something so damn good here, but the pathway was so convoluted, I just think there must have been a better way to do it. Now, it's still totally great because sometimes the ends do justify the means, but you can see people going back and forth on social media today, and I do understand why they are scratching their heads, because literally about 20 minutes beforehand, we have been told, no Brian Danielson at the Grand Slam. So I am going to have to give that part a down, but again, who gives a flub? This was one of the greatest rivalries in Ring of Honor, and we are going to get it one more time. This is another great reason that AEW does exist. Otherwise, pfft, forget about it. Hook then challenged Roderick Strong to a match, even though last week Hook challenged Roderick Strong to a match when we got to our main event, which was our Casino Gauntlet tag team version. <laughs> Once again, I've got to be a negative Nancy. Because as much as I love this concept and I do keep going on about this, I think we have just done one too many now. I mean, the last one was all in, which is like two weeks ago. I also just think that AEW should double down here and turn it into its own pay-per-view. Because if you only get one a year or maybe one or two a year, you can make such a big deal about it. And it's going to make people feel super duper pumped up. I also don't think it was as good with the tag teams, even though it was still damn entertaining. So I suppose this is very personal to me, but I'm going to give it a down. I don't want this too much because it's life, man. It's called the law of diminishing returns. Moving back to the great news, though. It is still such a laugh riot because it is chaos personified and I'm Dr. Robotnik. FTR and Carl Fletcher and Osprey were teams one and two, so they just lit the place up. This power bomb that Cash and Dax gave Will Ospreay. Just retire that move now. You're not going to do better than that. Fletcher then hit a Mishinoko driver, so Ospreay jumped off his mate's back, because why wouldn't you do that? Which is when FDR came back with the power plex. So look, at one point in the future, we got to do this match. The Righteous were in at number three, and I don't want to be horrible, but I actually totally forgot they did exist. Although they wrecked everybody here, and they even hit a boss man slam. It triggered the clock as the kingdom came to the ring. and They were going after Will Ospreay, who did have a target on his back. When we got to our next team, it was the Acclaimed, and they looked at the Young Bucks, who were sitting at ringside, because they don't like each other. This is when everybody started to go nuts, because we had so many bodies. When Stokely Hathaway was in the crowd clapping, 
That's gonna tie in somehow, and I don't know why. The fame asses then began because the acclaim loved that when the MXM collection, I think, debuted on Dynamite. Not sure we've seen them before, and I was so damn happy because I love that team. They were gonna touch tips when the acclaim cut them off, so they're definitely heels. When we got this massive old, big old suplex. I mean, we did have about 4,000 humans, why not? Top Flight were next, and they went all flippy dippy doo dah, and we even got a sequence between Dante Martin and Will Ospreay. So that's another one, we're gonna have to book it. Anthony Bowens didn't care, and he broke that up before he hit the shatter machine when we got the highlight of the night, because the next team in were the Outrunners, and they got such a good pop, and I wanna be that guy, meaning I'm gonna be that guy, but I have been talking about them on this damn show for ages, so to finally see them get their due, well, I'm just gonna tell you now, it is getting it up. Made me feel warm and fuzzy in my tum tum. I also think they should have won it, and I'm not kidding, when the grizzled young veterans were also here, and of course they got right into it with FTR, because they're taking on FTR this week on Collision. That's when Floyd and Mansoor did this crazy suplex off the top rope into yet more bodies. And at this point, it looked like a Raw Rumble where nobody had been eliminated. The runners then actually hit their running double team slam for a one 2 ooh and it was broken up by the righteous. So you listen to me, righteous. I am never going to forgive you. That's right. Anytime I do an ups and downs, if I find the opportunity to insult you, that's what you're gonna get. I think it then went Mike Bennett hitting a power driver, Carl Fletcher hitting a brain buster, Dante Martin hitting the Hurricane Rana. When he went to the top, he was gonna do something onto Kyle, who got the knees up, but all of a sudden, Will Ospreay flew in from nowhere. He killed him with the hidden blade. And because Carl was in the right position, he hooked the leg with a version of the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment, the surprise roll up. Although it wasn't really, Will Ospreay and Carl Fletcher are the brand new number one contenders. Now it also means at Grand Slam, we are getting these two versus the Young Bucks for those championships. And I'm sorry, that could be a match for the ages. When you look at these four individuals, they are some of the best talents in the world. So for that announcement alone, I am giving it an up. And I totally think we should have set this up too. Here it comes though. I just don't think we should have used this gauntlet to do it. Because even though AEW did go out of their way to make sure that outside the AEW walls, Carl Fletcher and Will Ospreay are an established tag team back inside the world of All Elite Wrestling, well, they're just not. You also have the fact that Ospreay is the international champion right now, and he just had that banger with MJF and that other banger with Pac. So when you do look forward, well, I think he should keep having bangers because it's only going to help that title. I mean, the Young Bucks match can happen whenever. You can come up with another way to justify that. Also, I just don't think that Will Ospreay should have won another gauntlet match, especially because while Carl Fletcher would have benefited more and he did get the pin, it was only because of William. Now, don't get me wrong, this was so much fun, that's all that matters. But given that the focus was on tag team wrestling and Carl Fletcher and Will Ospreay are never going to be a long-term tag team, I just think another team could have benefited more than what we did here. And look, I could be totally incorrect, we shall wait and see. But I don't mess with the finger of power. And yeah, I do think that part has to get it down. And sure, maybe I am just bitter about the Outriders not winning. It's more than fair to say. I mean, a dream of mine is to team with them, or just be at ringside with them, or just give them a hug, anything like that. I truly think they are the best. And after this main event, I am quite excited. So I am a massive nerd, and again, don't get me wrong, it was still a super duper fun final match. I just had some thoughts on it, which I've shared with you. Otherwise, this program wouldn't exist. But in terms of AEW Dynamite overall, Give it an up. Now, please do drop me a comment below and get mad at me because I've said something terrible, even though I've just given you opinions. Like the video, share the video, and subscribe. Click the video on the screen, which is ups and downs for All Out, so you can catch up with all of my opinions. But otherwise, my friends, I appreciate you a lot. See you soon.